Why do I call the chapter on the March on Washington the Sandwich Brigade? Because in an interview, Bernard Rustin called the volunteers that got together in the basement of Riverside Church in Harlem. They put together 80,000 box lunches. The support to do that came from a number of organizations, religious as well as organized labor. And he called these volunteers the Savage Brigade. They even had a, a manual that they sent out to the different parts of the country in which people would be converging onto Washington, a manual telling you what to bring to eat. It is very much like waging a war. If you look at research on the question, why did the North win the war? Part of the answer is that the North had a better infrastructure for feeding the troops. Welcome to the Fred Opie Show, a food history research and writing podcast. We focus on using history to unpack strategies for you to make a positive impact in your world. I'm your host, Fred Opie, a professor of history and food ways at Babson College. Today's show is an excerpt of a Southern Food and Civil Rights book talk I did at the Boston Public Library. The focus of the talk was the 1963 March on Washington through the lens of food. Q&A led to some interesting discussions about other topics that I found and learned about in the process of researching and writing this book. I talk about this chapter in my book, Southern Food and Civil Rights, Feeding the Revolution. That's today on the Fred Opie Show. I'm going to read you three excerpts from the book, and this is from the chapter, The Sandwich Brigade, which deals with the 1963 March on Washington. There were four church organizations whose leaders were part of the original planning committee. The National Council of Churches of Christ, United Presbyterian Church, the American Jewish Congress, and the National Catholic Conference were collectively involved in the success of the planning. Organizers sent letters to every church in the nation soliciting support. Ministers, priests, and rabbis were urged to speak from the pulpit about the importance of protesting against segregation and involvement in the march. Church congregations responded by sending donations and assisting with food and supplies. Churches provided food to marchers on their way to the march and sent lunches to the marchers in Washington. They also provided space for organizers to gather, usually over meals. The organizers knew that a, quote, a man who is hungry or thirsty doesn't know where he's going to spend the night may forget why he came to Washington in the first place, to demonstrate for jobs and for freedom. This understanding was a guiding force that led to meticulous planning for the basic needs of the marchers. With the support of labor unions and churches, marchers traveling to Washington from other states were well cared for. Baynard Rustin and Cleveland Robinson, the chairman of the administrative committee, had eight weeks to plan and organize the march. Organizers urged marchers to prepare wisely to sustain themselves for at least 12 hours. Although the program was scheduled to run two or three hours, most expected the marchers' experience from arrival to departure to last longer. So let me give you this a overarching premise of the book. And I'll use a simple quote that many of us have heard by Napoleon. I'll start it, see if you can finish it. An army marches on its stomach. That is the basis for the book. If you look at any sustained movement, it's got to have food involved. Food starts movements, sustains movements, and are the reason for movements. It started with a segment on NPR, listen to a lot of podcasts. There were two women who started doing this kind of research. They called themselves the Kitchen Sisters. And they took a look at a similar development on the Montgomery bus boycott and the role that women played in keeping that movement going. How often could I find this playing out? And sure enough, a lot of the civil rights movement, you'll see this. Now the last chapter is actually the afterword for the book. 
October 2011, I went to Occupy Wall Street. So it seems like such a long time ago now. (laughs) But I went down there and I embedded, as it were, in Occupy Wall Street and I hovered around what they called the People's Kitchen. And I did interviews. It was their job to keep that particular protest going. I gained their confidence and I asked them what role does food play in a social movement. That became the question that I used to write my book. It started off with just a title, which is the subtitle of the book, Feeding the Revolution. I just thought it was a, a really unique way to look at social movements. People have done the same thing with music in the civil rights movement. And certainly music was an important part. And, I'm, and I don't argue that food is more important than music, that it's a essential part in a movement. If you look at some of the current movements going on, like Black Lives Matter and other movements, if it's a sustained movement, if it's a labor dispute and people are going to be out of work for a long time, if you can keep those workers' families fed, the workers will remain united and in support of that movement. Those of us that live here in Boston, in which the Boston Marathon passed right in front of our street, neighbors set up coolers of cold water and ice, rolls and rolls of paper towels close to big pitchers full of ice water. And then once the fast racers passed, because they weren't stopping to talk to us for about nothing, but the, the normal runners that I could relate to, as those hordes came down the street, it was the members, the neighbors on both sides of the street providing orange slices, cold water, ice, anything we could to support those runners. And you, you remember, what was it, three years ago they had the heat wave, it was like almost in the 80s, you remember that one? It was brutal. If these people were not out here providing that kind of support, would some of these runners, would they actually make it? I, I don't think they would. You know, we had here in Boston the uh, deflate gate, right? We had that with the Patriots. All right, let me just preface, if I was this kind of person and I wanted the Patriots to win that bad, I wouldn't have to go through all that. All I'd have to do is deny the opposing team water. I mean, seriously, think about that. Now, I'm a former Syracuse University lacrosse player, and I actually had the opportunity to play on the U.S. national team. So I get a good sense of what dehydration does to you on the field. And if you just kept the opposing team when they came to Gillette Stadium from having access to water or spiked the water with something (laughs) that the other... Now, again, this is theoretical, folks. (laughs) Don't go out of here saying he said, go spike the other team's water. I'm not telling you to do that. But if you did, that team is doomed because something as basic as water is essential. And that's what I'm saying about protests. There, there are practical parts of protest that we just take for granted, and one of them is food. So I wanted to talk to you about the Sandwich Brigade, the very last chapter before, no, actually the second to last. So we, the, the last chapter is on the Nation of Islam and the role that food plays in that movement, which is pretty unique. And then the afterward I mentioned on the People's Kitchen. But this chapter on the on the uh, Sandwich Brigade. Why at the Boston Public Library? By the way, this is a phenomenal (laughs) facility. My son's walking in, particularly the new wing, and he's gone. This is a library? (laughs) You know, when when you get 14-year-olds excited about a library, you knew your architect did the right thing. So you did a great job here at the library. The reason I wanted to share with you the Sandwich Brigade chapter, because I remember doing the research for that chapter, and I used the archives of WGBH because they covered the March on Washington and the transcripts of all of the interviews that the journalists did are available online. So I came across that and so I have in the book people quoted who came from Boston to go to the 1963 March on Washington and I thought that would be a unique way to make this uh, more understandable to you all. So think about that process. You, you get on a bus and you leave Boston and you travel all the way down to Washington, D.C. You do that without some food and it's not going to be an enjoyable trip. And then once you get there, as I read part of the sections, that people didn't realize that you were there for almost 12 hours. And then you're back on the bus coming back home to Boston. That's a long ways if you don't have food. So it is an integral part. 
So what the organizers did, and I'll tell you about some of the organizers, that a lot of people don't know this, but it's true, that the organizers had a lot of experience. Certainly, they, they, you know, the, the March on Washington was unique in itself, but let me tell you that A. Philip Randolph, who was the principal organizer for the March on Washington, the labor organizer, he had probably, it was 1962, I have a chapter in here on when hospital workers in New York City and public funded hospitals, when they organized for the first time with the local 1199. They first organized, it was like 1956 through 1962. It took that long to organize all those workers. And A. Philip Randolph was, was involved in that strike. It was also the only labor dispute that we know of that Malcolm X, as a member of the Nation of Islam, came out and supported. There were black and brown workers, mostly Puerto Ricans, but some people of Cuban descent, and a whole lot of African Americans that had migrated from the Great Migration. Some of the same folks that probably came up here and settled, they settled in New York. And then a lot of folks who also came from different parts of the Caribbean. They were involved. And that 1962 labor dispute, we see in many ways the infrastructure that was also used during the 1963 March on Washington. His first lieutenant was Bayard Rustin in 1962 in that labor dispute. The person that I read in here, Bayard Rustin, shows up for the March on Washington. Forgive me for those of you who are avid readers and know this stuff, okay? So I know some of you know this, but some folks don't. What people don't realize is that A. Philip Randolph threatened FDR during the Great Depression that if you don't desegregate the institutions that are receiving money, like General Motors, that turn their plant from producing automobiles to producing for the war, but most of those plants, like Tarrytown, where I'm from that area in New York, that plant was turned over to a war effort with money from the federal government, but they did not hire any and everybody for all positions. It was a de facto Jim Crow plant. And this was happening around the country where businesses that were receiving contracts from the federal government to produce for the war were not allowing marginalized folks, black and brown folks, women, other people to get the same jobs as everybody else. They were reduced to menial type of labor, low paying jobs. So A. Philip Randolph, he goes to meet with FDR. The other thing people should understand that FDR was elected by the swing vote of African Americans during his election. But he goes to meet with FDR and he says, look, we need to make sure that these jobs at these facilities are available for everybody. If you don't, we're going to march on Washington. And FDR looked at him and thought he was bluffing. And he wasn't bluffing. And that's when those jobs at General Motors plants and other plants were changed so any and everybody could opportunity to apply for any job and get any job. The ideal of the March on Washington goes all the way back to the Great Depression. And then it was resurrected in 1963 as a way of passing legislation that John F. Kennedy was reluctant to do. This is another thing you find out, that John F. Kennedy was not in front of civil rights legislation. He was pulled by the activism of people who came out on the March on Washington. To give you some context of why I would be interested in this, so I'm the youngest of three. My name is Frederick Douglass Opie. The middle child, his name is Marshall. Firstborn of my mother and father's three children is named Randy. He's named after A. Philip Randolph. Neither of my parents graduated from college. My father was extremely well read. The story is, in August of 1963, when the march is going on, my mother, who is a organizer and recruiter for the NAACP, she's recovering from the birth of a very large child named Frederick. <laughs> and so it's my father who goes down to the march and represents the family. Now my mother is the more outspoken of the two and the more active as minded that many people from Westchester County where I'm from, when they would think of activism and protest, they would think of my mother. But what they did not know is that my father was just as diligent and interested. He filled the role of providing 
the necessary infrastructure for my mother to do her work. And that's something that it probably took me a while to figure out that that's what was going on. Randolph and another interesting character that I mentioned his name, Cleveland Robinson. Cleveland Robinson is Jamaican born. He's a labor organizer. He also played a pivotal role in organizing that march. The show will be right back. For related content on negotiating the world of school and sports, visit our website at fredopi.com. Check out our podcast archive and review the show on SoundCloud, Stitcher, and iTunes. The best way to support the podcast is to tell a friend. Share the show on Facebook and Twitter or send them to our website at fredopi.com. Start with your gift. Understand and monetize it while serving others with it. This book is written for the younger version of me. In Start With Your Gift, I help you recognize your gift, select mentors, choose the right school and training, consider childhood wounds in need of healing, identify internships, show you how to select jobs, get your financial house in order, live and give like no one else. And it's available on Amazon.com as a ebook or paperback. Now back to the show. Why do I call the chapter on the March on Washington the Sandwich Brigade? Because... In an interview, Bayard Rustin called the volunteers that got together in the basement of Riverside Church in Harlem. They put together 80,000 box lunch. The support to do that came from a number of organizations, religious as well as organized labor. And he called these volunteers the Savage Brigade. They even had a, a manual that they sent out to the different parts of the country in which people would be converging onto Washington, a manual telling you what to bring to eat. It is very much like waging a war. If you look at research on the question, why did the North win the war? Part of the answer is that the North had a better infrastructure for feeding the troops. All this was done without the support of JFK and against the desire of J. Edgar Hoover. Lined on both sides and on top of the buildings on the way to Lincoln Memorial were federal troops. They assumed all these black folks come together, there's gonna be a problem. They required every liquor store within the District of Columbia to be closed. I mean, just, you know, just talk about this rampant kind of stereotype. They thought it was gonna be violent, People would tear down the city, all these different things. And they prepared for the absolute worst. And there was not one problem associated with violence and drunken behavior whatsoever. If you look at the march, it is a completely integrated march in terms of gender, religious persuasion, ethnicity, and any other way you could say. Never could have happened without them taking the time to think about the importance of food and beverages in this particular movement. You know, the other thing, too, is that nobody's going to come. You know, it's all the detractors. Nobody's going to come. You're wasting your time, wasting your money. By about 10 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden Union Station is packed with people. The bus station is packed with people and people just start coming in in, in hordes. Now, there were people who were just regular tourists there and said, wow, this seems cool. Let's go check this out. But they didn't prepare food. So there are stories of people complaining about trying to obtain sustenance so they can stay uh, throughout the particular event. That does happen. And what the organizers did is made sure that there were meals that were sold at a subsidized rate by vendors around the actual event. So it was also provided there. It's the role of celebrity in the, in the march. Probably the most important organizer among the celebrity would be Harry Belafonte. I mean, he talks to who's who of Hollywood to come and support the movement, which put pressure on the administration to support the movement. So it's understanding the role that celebrity played then and, and even now. And there was a different tier of sustenance provided for those celebrities. They had a place behind the Lincoln Memorial that was roped off, exclusive to the celebrities, where they had catered food for those people. There is hierarchy even among the movement. I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned if you are a person who is trying to organize an event, organize a group, or trying to advance your cause, that you got to take into consideration the role that food plays. My mother, I used to see her when she would be organizing not only for the civil rights movement, but later on she was very involved in the anti-apartheid movement, Freedom Nelson Mandela movement. And as she was organizing these events, 
they would always have meetings in which people were told, bring this to eat, bring that to eat, as part of the planning sessions, could, which could go on for several hours at a time. It's one of these integral things. I don't want you to think it is the reason for the success of the civil rights movement. It's the cause of the movement in many instances. The earlier chapters of the book talk about the movement against A&P supermarkets, which was the first big box store type of grocery store. Those stores were opening in black neighborhoods across the country. They were not hiring African Americans in all opportunities. The movement was set against them. It's a theme that I talk about. I'd love to hear what your questions are. I want a question and not a whole lengthy dissertation. <laughs> so I'd like to, to have you talk a little bit more about um, the Nation of Islam and their food culture and to what extent their health food uh, emphasis is connected to other health food movements and to what extent are they just doing that on their own? Great question about the Nation of Islam. Their strategy to the marginalization of African Americans, the mistreatment of African Americans, was don't beg, don't march, get your own economic engine. The Nation of Islam is built on the work of Marcus Garvey. And Marcus Garvey, his work is based on the strategy of Booker T. Washington and Tuskegee Institute, which was get your own piece of the pie, make your own pie and get your own piece of the pie. So what they were teaching is economic independence. That's one thing. One of the things I did not know is that the Nation of Islam had its own infrastructure in terms of food. They purchased and operated farms, several farms. They had dairies, they had restaurants, they had bakeries. It's a lot more than me growing up and spending time in Washington DC as an undergrad and seeing brothers on the corner in busy intersections selling bean pies. There's a whole lot more than that. The second part of your question was the health mind of that. Elijah Muhammad, who wrote two books on food, two different volumes, an attempt to transform the diet of African Americans after the experience of several centuries of enslavement. But there are extremely healthy parts of it uh, that you know, one, one can certainly benefit. And put it this way, I have never seen a member of the Nation of Islam that is dealing with the obesity, the high blood pressure, the diabetes that the general population of African Americans is dealing with. In my very first book, Hog and Hominy, there's a whole chapter towards the end of that book called Food Rebels. And it talks about people like the Nation of Islam, Elijah Muhammad, uh, Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali. It's home for that movement in Chicago. And in Chicago, one of the most important understudied people in holistic medicine. Again, I've done some work on this, my podcast, there's a whole documentary on Dr. Albinia Fulton, Dr. Fulton. She is revered by many people who have made a lot of money in the holistic food. She, her claim to fame was teaching people about fasting. And if you know anything about the Nation of Islam, you eat two meals a day and it really is a fasting lifestyle. That would be the other connection that Dr. Fulton's connection to probably the nation is on. I, I hope that answered your question. That was a great question. When you were doing your scholarship and research on this work, what was the most fascinating, inspirational thing you found? Ooh, you're asking me to ask which of my two children do I like the most? <laughs> That's a good question. Probably the collection of recipes and African-American food writers in African-American newspapers. The Defender, the Cleveland Call, the Amsterdam News, a number of these papers that have been around forever in African-American communities and that they had food writers, food sections, and recipes galore. So when I did the book, each of the section has related recipes from that time period. So when I'm talking about the Montgomery bus boycott, I talk about what they were eating, what they were selling to help support the Montgomery Improvement Association, for example, pound cake, fried chicken. And then there's recipes from the state of Alabama from the same time period of the movement. As one would liken to pairing wine with different types of, of meat, I did that with the recipes. I was able to go into a pro-class historical newspapers. And you can go into the database and you can put, for example, there's great gumbo, by the way, at the restaurant here in the library. So you could put gumbo and then you could put, do a search from 1920 to 1950, 
1950, and then you could put, look for the word Louisiana. So you, I could pinpoint just about any and everything I wanted to do, and it, it was wonderful. A book that was written right before this is on Zora Neale Hurston. We have some copies of that as well. That, that's where I learned how to do that, and then I applied it to this. Now, why did I include recipes? Because the first book I did on Hog and Hominy, I did events just like this, and people kept raising their hand. Why don't you have recipes? <laughs> and I said, I won't make that mistake again. I wanted to ask, have you examined the, uh, the anti of this, which is quelling civil rights before it even comes up? Like, for instance, uh, bread and circus having food stamps, all these things in place in these communities that if they had been more hungry, they might have come up against the system a lot earlier. So I'll give you an example of looking at SNCC. It was a SNCC movement in Mississippi to organize voter registration drives. And what the powers that be did is they cut off food aid to the members of that community who were getting involved in that voter registration drive. So they understood quickly. So the threat was, yeah, you go ahead and vote and see if you're going to eat. Who came to the aid of that movement was Dick Gregory at the height of his power. So he organized a, similar we talk about um, when there's a famine someplace and we fly in food. He actually did that to this community in Mississippi uh, under the auspices of the voter registration drive of SNCC. So that happened. It's a great question. The issue was really to, to what, to, what to cut. So what do you decide what's not going to make it into the chapter? If I don't have enough information to whittle it down to the best of it, then I, it's, got, it's got to stay out. If you, if you go to my website, fredobie.com, there's a food blog there. And a lot of these stories are, and a lot of the recipes we talked about are there. So you can actually cook right off the recipes. So much of the march was spontaneous. Like, how do they organize all of the food to support the people that were doing the sit-ins and the marching? Were there organizations like churches and restaurants? The restaurant or the March on Washington in particular? Just the civil rights movement in general. Now here's a question that I ask my students. And this, in many ways I'm, I'm answering your question. What's the difference between a movement and a riot? Organization. Riots are not organized. Movements require meticulous planning. I'm going to take you to a Hollywood scene to answer your question. The movie Selma. What's the first thing that happens when King and the other noted activists come into Selma? They go to a woman's house and they have a serious sit-down meal. And it's after that meal and during that meal that they begin to strategize. An integral part of the civil rights movement was planning. And that planning happened around restaurant tables. There's a lot of planning that goes on. I mentioned my lacrosse background. So I have a podcast where I interview players, coaches, and parents from the, from the sport of lacrosse as a way of sharing life lessons through the lacrosse journeys. So one of the things I do when I ask coaches, particularly there's an assistant coach, a new one here at BC. Her name is uh, Kayla Trainer, outstanding player at Syracuse where I went. And she's the assistant coach. So a question I ask these new coaches, what's something that you thought about being a coach that you realized you had it all wrong when you became a coach? And they all say, I had no idea how much my coach did behind the scenes in getting our team to have the success that we had. And that's what happens. A lot of people don't know just how much planning goes in to coaching, to teaching, uh, to running a library like this, to putting on an event like this. It takes a lot of planning. You know, think about my classroom where I taught today from 9.45 straight through to 105. If I come in at 9.45 and the, the computer's not working, I use a lot of technology when I teach. If the classroom wasn't clean that night before by the janitorial staff, if the whiteboards are not all clean, I can't do my job. That's all planning, that's all organizing. The other thing I'd say from the, from the book that I try to say to people is, there's always something you could do to advance the cause that you support. You don't have to be the person with the mic in your hand. There's always something you can do. And to say you can't do anything, and the story of the civil rights movement is, people did 
what they could do with what they had. And we all have a gift in some way we can use it. And never despise the little thing that you can do. That's the end of my sermon. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Thank you for taking the time to listen. If you like what you hear in the show, share a link on Facebook or Twitter or send the link to a friend. If you have a question you want us to address on the show, write me at sdopie at gmail.com. You can find our show archive, blog, suggested reading, and more at fredopie.com. That's a wrap for this show. Thanks for listening. This show could have been brought to you by your company. If you have questions about advertising and sponsoring this show, contact us at fdopie at gmail.com. 